Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 344. Episode number 344. How are you guys doing? How are you guys feeling? Great, amazing. Um, if it's your first time being here, your first time hanging out, your first time checking out the, sh the, uh, the show, make sure you do me a favor, hit that like button, smash subscribe, and of course, leave me a comment down below. And if you're listening via the podcast app, the best you can do is leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends. And if you want to support the show further and you feel like, you know, I provide you with some good comedic content, mm -hmm. some great hard-hitting news, some um, forward-thinking, forward, yeah, forward-thinking cultural commentary, whatever that might mean, then you can also contribute to the show via Patreon. I've just set it up recently. Um, Patreon donations are as low as $1 actually at the moment. Just a $1 check if you want to throw my way to support my uh, copious drinking habits here. All right, I've got some kombucha that I'm drinking here with a bit of lemon then feel free to do that too. My Patreon link is in the show note description. It's going to be patreon.com forward slash Agostino, A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O, patreon.com forward slash Agostino. Click that link below, support the show, only $1, and you're going to get all this content ahead of time. So I'll put it out on all the regular platforms, but if you want to get it ahead of time and you want to support the show, make sure you click that Patreon link. It'll be in the show note descriptions. So what else has been going on? Um, Yeah, you know what I was thinking today? I'm actually quite happy. MMA is back. And Dana White pushed to get the MMA back up and running. Uh, UFC, sorry, back up and running. I'm actually happy about that. I remember the time when he was going around trying to get the fights up and running, trying to put money in the in the fighters' pockets, talking, boasting about how he hadn't let go of any of his staff members. We were looking at him like, this guy's a flipping psychopath, right? He might still be a, a, a sociopath. You know, I think you, to do that job, right, to be the promoter, and the main head honcho was, you know, at least in terms of camera facing head honcho, you need to have that kind of, you know, um, bordering on dickish personality. But he really pulled it off, man, in 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 fantastic style. Fight Island isn't actually on the island. It's in a tent that happens to be on the island. But still, he pulled that off. He managed to get all the fights um, in, in Las Vegas done via hitch for the most part. And he's provided people like myself who are casual MMA, UFC fans with some really much needed entertainment when you know it's been a bit bleak out there it's some of, even the football i'm sure there's been a lot of people that have kind of dropped off from watching football who have kind of gone back into it again because there's just nothing else to watch on tv there's only or on streaming platforms there's only so many um crime documentaries or exposés on pablo escobar you can watch until you start getting bored out your nuts so i'm sure football has definitely impacted some people as well so it's good to see man honestly i'm actually this has actually been one of the benefits or blessings of this whole lockdown period you know the whole self-reflection thing has gone you know no one cares about self-reflection everyone's like remember at the start everyone's like oh my god we're gonna the oceans are gonna be clear we're gonna be we're gonna be able to what you got the 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 world can heal again we're gonna be able to think about the things we want to do in our lives all this sort of like airy fairy stuff and now people don't give a toss people just want to get back to living their regular scheduled lives and i think much like you know similar to like really toxic or uh yeah maybe similar to like really toxic relationships you don't know the damage is done until you've kind of separate yourself from that person right you don't know it, the extent that they've actually dug their emotional um claws into you until that person's no longer in your life and then you suddenly turn around and you're like bloody hell man i've got some actual real 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 life scars here that i've got to kind of address over a long period of time and i think that's what we're in now we're not we haven't really figured out or come to a realization as to how bleak of a situation it is so not to be a debbie downer but god damn it man i think this the effects are going to be felt for a long long time but you know Silver lining is that we've got a vaccine on the way, right? Oxford, I think, university is trialing a vaccine. Um, if they do, if they're able to get it out within the time frame that they're kind of estimating, which is 18 months, it's going to be, you know, whoever is responsible for it will be up for a Nobel Peace Prize or something along those kind of lines. It'll be completely out, um, out of the norm for that to happen. So that's pretty cool, right? That's a good thing. Um, and then I think in general in the UK, we've got this thing about we're going to have a compulsory um, face coverings in the UK, which is, I think, which is a great thing. It's a bit late in the in the making, but I think just trying to get some kind of handle on this, especially in any kind of way we can when it comes to distancing and coverings is the best we can hope for. And then little by little, you can start opening up the economy because I think 
I just my heart goes whenever I feel bad, whenever I feel down, I just think of somebody that might have been opening up a restaurant, right? Uh a small business, uh, some sort of brick and mortar store just before COVID really started ramping up because it started to only really get sticky in the UK, I'd say what, March? Right, February, March, I went to Berlin in February, come back, went Berlin, come back, you know, and things were okay. So it started to get a real bit sticky around March, I'd say March, April times when suddenly people started to realize, oh crap, we might be in a real situation here. So imagine if you were, you know, a couple, a little collective, a little team, some high school friends, you got together, put some money in a pot and decided to finally launch your, I don't know, your pizza restaurant, your slice restaurant, um, your little bistro, and then this hits like I, I don't know what I don't know man or somebody that expanded imagine you was you know you had your little shop that you um cared and loved for and you know you thought you were on the you were on the path that made sense you know some expansion gets um expand your reach obviously um allow you to earn a bit more hire a few more people spread the word about the cuisine that you're currently cooking and bam you know an invisible virus in basically shutters down your business like I think of that often and of course, I also think of children, like kids that are like, let's say, secondary school and under, like how boring and terrible the situation it must be to be at home all day, not able to see your friends, not able to hang. Well, you can hang out nowadays, I think. Well, you can, yeah, now you can hang out. But it's also depending on your household. If you've got a household where your parents are maybe um, of the age where they feel as if they can't take any risks, you're not going outside. Or if you've got parents that are just overly protective, you're not going outside. So imagine what that that must be like. You're a kid that's like, I don't know, 15, 14, 13, 12. You've not been around your friends in ages. You've missed out that kind of, you know, because I guess being in school, you don't really realize how much you grow as a person just from just hanging out, <laughs> right? You could be the worst student in the world, right? Get all the bad grades, being the lowest sets, but just being around people, your peers, right? People, you know, a couple of years older than you, a couple of years younger than you, same year as you really helps to mold you and and kind of develop or help to push your personality in the right or wrong way. It really does. So I can only imagine what these extended periods of time being at home can do because it's not as if, you know, it'd be fine if we were a country where there was some kind of onus on homeschooling. Maybe there was some sort of like, you know, in maybe like strict societies like somewhere in Southeast Asia where kids come back home and they have like designated period of time where they have to do a bit of self-study at home then the transition to I guessing homeschooling wouldn't be that difficult because I think your parents would have some indication of what's needed of you maybe the teachers would have some sort of agreement with your parents about what they can do to help out you would be in a mindset where you you'd kind of you know you've kind of got it in your brain when you come home you also do work but if you're a kid and you go and you go to a normal secondary school or primary school and you associate home with just you know being with your siblings hanging out with your family and also at the end of school right at the end of school when school ends and you come back home that's when you're on the computer all day hanging out to suddenly switch for your brain to switch and suddenly um categorize or classify home with study is a lot it's a lot it's not an easy thing for your brain to suddenly go okay now we're at home now we're studying now it's like yeesh that's what i feel sorry for so i think and again, even even just like, you know, I don't know, people that have some families and they have to go work in a menial job somewhere that they can't take, that they can't work from home from. Like, it's better for those people too, like cleaners and stuff. Like, what are you going to do? Like, I guess it's a good thing because it allows your children to grow up really quickly, right? They're going to have to spend um, large chunks of time alone and you're going to have to trust one of them to take kind of, you know, ownership and sort of like, you know, um, lead be the kind of the the quote-unquote man of the house for lack of a better term uh, but it's not the easiest thing to do in it to kind of relinquish that control and that guardianship to your, a kid that you didn't really think would need to do that right like ugh, mad man absolutely mad so i don't know i let's like keep it into perspective right? i mean it's crappy for me but just spare thought for people that you know that i mentioned there i think they they are suffering as much as anybody else but i guess we all are and it? it's not suffering olympics but hey what can you do what's the have to, 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 to you a bear do 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 oh this is a funny little update regarding the crystal situation right and i think i've revised my opinion on the situation especially considering what i've heard lately um regarding this supposed um supposedly there's a a, ne a kind of hollywood industry hollywood comedy scene entertainment scene expose due to come out soon 
Um, I think I've gathered that information from Joey Diaz's podcast a few episodes ago where he basically mentioned that a few journalists are basically ringing around comedy clubs and asking questions about certain comics and what happened here on this tour, what happened here during this performance. So everyone's sort of on, everyone's basically on notice. And that might have been the reason why a lot of Chris Elias friends, when, when the news broke that he was being accused of, you know, um, trying to hook up with underage girls, that supposedly those um Hollywood, those LA comedy scene friends that were quick to frame under the bus, you know, the Whitney Cummings, Brian Callen, Brendan Shaw, a whole litany of other people, maybe except for the exception of Theo Vaughan, maybe. But all the people that threw him under the bus, maybe because they're signed with WME or, or what's the other one? CAA. These incredibly powerful, you know, um, um, agents, right, in the Hollywood industry or the entertainment industry who for sure have connections and links with people all over the place, right? And for sure in law enforcement or within journalism or within some of these, you know, broadsheets, right? I'm sure they have people in there that are feeding them information. So if there was something, if there was, because usually it, 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 it's never, yeah, usually it always feels like whenever someone gets accused of some sort of sexual assault, there's always, there's always like a big story that comes with it right from either a new york times the la times new york post there's always some sort of like um article that kind of supports it whether it's the journalist reaching out to the um to the victim and sort of saying hey i can amplify your voice or it's a concentrated effort for the victim to put out a story on instagram and then for it to kind of get some traction so that the the writer could then go and pitch it to their edit to their editor and then put it out there's a whole sort of run market marketing plan or kind of, um, yeah, or release plan, right? In terms of making sure it gets as viral as it can and reaches the most people as it can so you can impact some sort of change. So that's what I'm thinking about. I'm like, hmm, maybe there's something more to their silence because it just doesn't make any sense, it? especially because I've been watching a lot of videos from Ying Yang Monkeys. So definitely check him out. Ying Yang Monkeys, I think he's on YouTube. He's on YouTube. He puts up little um, compilations of various LA comics, like, you know, um, funny moments on various podcasts. And it's just a shame to see, you know, all those great moments from Chris being basically put into a vault. You're not sure whether you're going to see him on a podcast again. So it got me thinking. Then suddenly this article pops up on my timeline from the Los Angeles Times. Unfortunately, it says here the title is Netflix Scraps Upcoming Crystalia and Brian Callum Prank Show. So this might have given us an indication why Brian was so quick to disown um, Chris Lee on his podcast T5K um, the Friday Kid when he said oh I don't know the guy <laughs> we haven't talked together um, I haven't seen anything and then he's here and then he went he went ahead and deleted every single picture of Chris on his Instagram page so I'm sure that was part of the reason if you're familiar with the Fire and the Kid you would know that Brian Callen even though he's been very fortunate in his career to you know essentially have one of the biggest LA based podcasts in the Fire and the Kid right Brenda Shaw was you know um, obviously played a big part in it but he's been a part of a really popular podcast he's friends with joe rogan so he doesn't necessarily need to kowtow to the hollywood elites but he's in a position but admittedly for himself he's always wanted to be you know accepted by the hollywood industry as much as he tries to kind of tell himself otherwise so it should be no surprise that he was be the first to sort of like back under the pressure and not back his friends up especially you know coming off the back of appearing for a brief second in the joker movie it makes some sort of sense um, of course you would prefer him to be more you know stand up for his friend but you know we can't be telling these people how to live their lives it's none of our business I think if you're in the same position as Brian Cannon was and your career was suddenly taking some kind of uptick right you had your own little you had your own um, spin-off TV show with the Goldbergs that he was doing then you're suddenly appearing in Joker even, even if it's briefly for a couple of seconds it's still a good look in terms of you in terms of industry stuff and you know good connections and exposure and relevancy all that sort of nonsense your podcast is taking up Joe Rogan um, proximity sort of like shine you're getting a bit of rub from him that's a good thing so if anything it makes sense why he'd want to throw his friend under the bus considering you know anything that's gone on in his career especially if you pay attention to a podcast you know you know brian kind of has had it hasn't had it easy in hollywood right it's loads of kind of failed attempts to try and be the next um what this what, they, what do they say uh what, what is it tom hanks is it the brendan Shaw takes a piss out of him that supposedly he was built to be the next tom hanks so he was he always had that kind of chip on his shoulder so for him to get panicked and think you know what I don't want, like, I've got a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh chance of a career. I'm not going to fuck it up now. Not for anybody, even for my one of my closest friends in the industry. Um, and I guess 
maybe again it's hard to swallow if you're chris but i guess maybe if you're chris you would not be that annoyed because you know what it is right the game is the game i think if chris was in the same position and something like that happened to brian i'm sure he will maybe do the same thing i think so i don't know who knows we can't suck and there's just too much but it's interesting to watch from the outside and again like i mentioned most so because these guys talk such a big game about being independent and doing what they want but in the moment something happens like this they do sort of like react the same way that you know your regular Chris Hemsworth would have reacted. They do exactly the same thing, right? The statements that are just, you know, a bit vanilla, um, the, the the distancing from the person, the non com the non comments about it. Like it's just yeah, but what can you do? Let's read the article from Los Angeles Times. It says the show was cancelled. So they had a prank show together, which would have been pretty cool considering their comedic um sort of uh connection they have right they, they've done loads of before brian callen deleted them all there's loads of great little videos of brian callen and, and chris delia together doing some funny skits on the streets a lot of really cool improv stuff so it would have been a pretty cool show but hey what can we do so the article says the following a month after chris delia was accused of sexual in impropriety by multiple women netflix have confirmed it has decided not to proceed with a prank show featuring the comic in june numerous women came forward on social media and then in the times claiming that the stand-up comedian had acted inappropriately towards them delia 40 denied that he had knowingly pursued in the underage females emphasizing that he'd only engaged in legal and consensual relationships when the allegation surfaced delia had only just closed a deal with netflix to make a show with one of his best friends a fellow comedian and Brian Kellen. Oh man, that timing, man, that bloody timing, which makes me think if some of these things are like concerted efforts because we we haven't really got any update from these girls. And again, maybe it could be because they're taking legal action, but the allegations have sort of died down, right? They, that Instagram that they had up with all the allegations that's sort of gone gone away, right? Or it hasn't been updated in a while. I don't know. I haven't checked, but um. It doesn't feel as if like there's a lot of steam behind this anymore and i wonder why it's obviously it could be um the calm before the storm before this supposed article comes out or it could just be because there is nothing to it but the timing especially if you're innocent must be brutal if you're guilty then it doesn't matter what the timing is you know it is what it is you just you deserve that karma um but if, if you are innocent, that timing is brutal. Securing a deal with Netflix to produce a show, even if you're Crystal Lear, it's not easy, I'm assuming, right? To close shows and get them greenlit is not an easy process. To finally get it done, you're going to do it with your best friend, who I'm sure Netflix would have not wanted to use it because, you know, Netflix have turned Brian Callen down a few times for his special. So I would imagine they're probably pushing for somebody else and you finally get your friend to do it or you finally get Netflix on board to kind of greenlight your friend to do it and suddenly this pops up. It's like, Youch. So it continues. Continue. It says um, the non-scripted series was to focus on the relationship between the two comics and their affinity for pulling high jinx, according to sources familiar with the deal. But the show had yet to go into production, and when Delia came under fire, Netflix scrapped the show. A spokesman for the streaming network confirmed. Neither Delia, Delia's lawyer, nor Khan's agent immediately responded to a request for comment. Delia still has a number of projects uh, available for Netflix, which is which I guess is kind of a good sign. But I don't know if it is because usually if it's a real if it's a real serious case, like something that is you know there's a lot of evidence online as it is, they'll just quickly delete it because they don't want any any kind of blowback. But I guess when it's when it's these sort of like he said she said claims and you know they all sound like really bad sort of um, inter sexual inter encounters as opposed to knowingly trying to groom underage girls in you know it's from what it seems like it seems like it, it, it was him being an absolute douchebag when it comes to dealing with girls right he's not necessarily a romeo right um he gets straight he gets straight to the business and kind of leaves no if buts or maybe so it does seem like most of them were really just terrible interactions right with somebody you idolize you think he's a really fun comedian um you get close to him and then you you expect you know that same person on instagram to be the same person me in the green room it just doesn't work out that way so maybe if you're netflix you're like we could keep them up, but does do Netflix want that kind of issue? I don't really know what it says to it, but you know, it's a shame, really, all things considered, for all for all parties, isn't it? Because it's really dragging out. I'm sure if you're a victim and you actually want him to be punished as well, it must be painful to, you know, it feels like it's just stuck in the mud um, with lawyers. I'm assuming probably slapping down what you call it, what they what they what those things called when you can't talk about things um, on people. I'm sure it says it continues here. It says. Um, 
Da, da, da. His free comedy special is an addition to the second season of his You, in which he was played the sexual predator. He is also set to appear in Army of the Dead, a Netflix movie directed by Zack Snyder that was filmed prior to allegations and is still slated to release in 2021. I wonder what they're going to do. Will they just like delete him from the, from the movie or they just leave him up there? Because for sure, once that movie comes back out, people will just be regurgitating the allegations again and it's just going to keep cycling through. It's like the it's like that Jeffree Star clip of, of him saying the N word in somewhere in LA. Whenever he does something bad, that clip comes back out again. <laughs> it's just like a system. <laughs> Mate, getting cancelled is so dead, man. So dead. It continues. It says, last month, five women. Da, da, da. Yeah, we know that. But yeah, um, that's the news, man. That's the news, unfortunately. And maybe it's a cautionary tale, isn't it? Maybe this is a cautionary tale. If you're Brian Callan, you know, you spent, you, you, they were so quick to reply. Literally before the allegations that's even dried, right? The ink dried in the allegations, they were quickly on their show crying and sobbing and weeping and going on as if the guy died or he committed, a, you know, a school shooting, God forbid. And, you know, they distanced themselves from him really quickly, but that didn't really help, did it? The show still got cancelled. And who knows what damage this has done to, you know, their respective relationships in that building regardless so i don't know is it worth doing those public distancing with your friends especially in hollywood when the industry is snaky anyway they don't give a shit about anyone unless you're just squeaky clean you don't get any love from anybody so if you make a mistake you're out um is it worth it really throwing your friend under the bus or is there something more to the story that we're not aware of are there some really serious allegations that have yet to kind of see the light of day that would really just put this whole thing to bed who knows who bloody knows but one thing i'm for sure is i'm just happy that i don't live in la i'm happy that i'm not trying to become some sort of you know <clears throat> action movie star or something because god forbid mate god forbid you are trying to do that and you get into some kind of hot and bo hot bother not don't, don't get me wrong i'm not talking about you know trying to sleep with underage girls that's that's a madness but just imagine you get into some argument with a girl in a shopping center or something right and you call her the c word in frustration you know she's giving you lip back she pushing you into the queue she's not backing down you're getting mugged off in public you're getting angry frustrated you just call her the c word oh, are you flipping and you, you, your whole career comes tumbling down right <laughs> just off that one comment it's not worth it or your friends distance themselves from you they delete their pictures they do that classic thing where they unfriend you on instagram it's like god man Come on, come on. What can you do? What can you do? Next on the list here, we have... What should we talk about? Yeah, let's do this one. Joey Negro has changed his name. Are you familiar with this story? So, as I mentioned previously with the Black Madonna um, story that broke a couple of days ago, it seems as if there's like a concentrate. Well, I, I guess as a consequence to the untimely passing of George Floyd and the uh, the kind of uh, revitalization of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, all aspects of you know um, non yeah every aspect of diversity or every aspect of social injustice is kind of being addressed now. Right, people are taking advantage of the eyes and the ears and the seriousness with which these issues are being dealt with, and you know basically. Put, put in their case forward whether it's you know um awards for literature whether it's for diversity the electronic music scene everyone is basically trying to fight their case and part of it has been this really weird split within the techno dance community scene right underground music culture whatever you maybe call it where a, a kind of really committed group of people in the industry who mostly refer to as a techno twitter that are really outspoken about social issues and shady stuff that's going on in the industry have essentially used this opportunity to really call out a lot of stuff and kind of um make us question why things were let you know to slide for so long that way when they could have just been changed from the beginning and one of those things was dj names right so you got the black madonna you know the name i always thought was a bizarre for a really pale white woman to have the name of the black madonna just didn't make any sense and of course when she dug into it a bit deeper and you heard her speak in the interview it was relating to the catholic saint the black madonna and you know how it was depicted and the illustrations and stuff that 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 cool but it just seemed weird in it just to call yourself that and another one that was always strange to me and again someone i'm a fan of because i you know i play a lot of disco um i play a lot of house a lot, of some, a lot of cool edits in that or new disco re-edits and one of the main p protagonists of making really good re-edits of classic disco funk soul tunes is none other than Joey Negro and he has fallen victim to the change your name guillotine and um, credit to him he actually did change it because 
it's all well and good being called out in public, right? But I do sometimes get the feeling, especially when you get called out in public by people who are pretty outspoken and have a way of commanding or have a way of speaking online that can come across a little bit mean and a little bit um, aggressive to then un to, to, to seriously listen to it and take action just does speak a lot for who that person is. Maybe again, maybe to be a bit cynical, maybe they're doing it because they just want to save their career. They're quaking their boots. But a part of me still thinks that the majority of people Especially if you look, yeah, that's the majority of people. I say there's a split in terms of the fans of electronic music who care about this sort of issues, and there's a split who, there's a segment of the population who don't care, who just have no, no care in the world. And I think a good illustration of that is if you go on, do you remember this, that Sarah King girl that had that fuck the BPM t shirt, right? If you go on each platform where she posted her apology, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, especially Facebook and Instagram, they're completely different responses than what she got on Twitter. Twitter's where she got called out and basically dragged in public. But when she posted the apology on Instagram, no one really cared. They didn't really know what was going on. When she posted her apology on Facebook, no one really knew what was going on either. So it's not within, it's not really set up in a way where it's really, um, to their benefit that they kind of back under the pressure and kind of acquiesce to the demands of the mob really if they don't want to change their name they don't need to no one's really going to notice right um it's only a small minority on twitter that i sort of vocalized again but i thought it was an interesting topic anyway regardless and i think um the name was if you just look at it from the outside perspective it is a bit weird isn't it to have like a dude whose name is what dave lee or something right um called himself joey negro but it's i'm also got a bit of sympathy for it too because i think as an artist you should be allowed to have creative license to kind of name your works be influenced by be inspired by co-opt or take from different places to make your art you know with impunity really you shouldn't be restricted to oh you can only take inspiration from this certain um area of history or from this particular background of people like that's not what art is about really in it um, I would think so, but let's just read the article and see what he has to say for it. So this is from Resident Advisor. It says Dave Lee drops Joey Negro stage name. Now, to be honest, just optically looking, right? Joey Negro looks like a far more interesting and cooler name than Dave Lee. You can't really blame him for choosing that name. And I think we've, we've all been there, innit? No? I know when I first started DJing, I went through like, what, six different names, right? until i landed on handsome black man even that i'm still a bit like it's a bit cringe but it's really difficult to come up with a good name right um especially if you've got i don't know a pretty standard run-of-the-mill you know english dave lee sort of name i'd imagine coming up with something a little bit more exotic quote unquote without using the worst term right losing a 50 cent term would be pretty difficult as well um to land it um but yeah let's read the article so the English producer will no longer use his most famous al alias, he announced in a Facebook post. Uh, Dave Lee will no longer use his alias Joey Negro. The English producer addressed the name change in a Facebook post today in which he also explained how he came up with his most famous, um, sorry, with his most popular alias in 1990 and why he continued to using it for three decades. <sighs> 30 years though, bros. God damn, it's a long time, isn't it? It's all well and good way to change. That's why... Oh. So I wonder how the I wonder how those people feel that were calling him out for it. Is it be, is it better never than late that he's doing it now, or do you still feel a bit annoyed that it took him thirty years to change it? Because I'd be a bit annoyed by it. Again, I, I don't really have a horse to race. I could care less. Um, but I think if I really did give a shit, I'd be like, hey, it's been thirty years, and you're giving me an essay. Just change it and keep it moving. We don't care about your essays, isn't it? That's what I would say. But let's read what he has to say anyway, regardless. I want to hear his essay. Let's see. I have to get the next page okay bear with me it's loading up on facebook let's read what he has to say regarding this and what the apology oh it's a long apology so he starts off with the following he says i have understandably been asked the question of how did you come up with the alias joey negro many times all right cool um if you don't know here's a story back in 99 um i produced my first solo release and i wasn't sure if it was any good or what to do with it I was running a label called Republic owned by Rough Trade at the time and had licensed material from a uh, NYC label called New Groove on several occasions. They were a super cool label. Um, so I sent my song to Frank and Karen there and they said that they liked it and had a gap in the schedule so that we, we could pre uh, prepare to release it. 
normally I'm okay at thinking of names, but I just couldn't come up with anything, as I, you know, as I said before. And the label said that they needed all the credits by the end of the week. I had a pile of records next to my desk. Amongst them was a pal, Joey, reached to Mars and a Jay Walter Negro shoot the pump. I wrote down a few of the names of the vinyl, put them next to each other. The one time uh, I'd heard a Jay Walter Negro record on the radio as a new release, the DJ announced it as Negro. He does have a, hmm, he loves writing the word Negro, isn't it? This, 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 uh, uh, I'm not sure how comfortable I am with his um, overuse of the word Negro. He feels uh, oddly comfortable using it, my friend here. But hey, what do I know? Let's continue. It says here, uh, la, 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 la. Uh, the one time I'd heard the J. Walter Negro record on the radio as a new release, the DJ announced it as Negro, the Spanish pronunciation. That's how I heard it and then used it first as I used it. Yeah. So why didn't I use Dave Lee? He says, in retrospect, I should have done. But to be completely honest, it just uh, seemed boring compared to the likes of Junior Vasquez, David Romales and Frankie Knuckles, who are making some of my favorite records at the time. Now, that is an interesting thing, observation in it, right? Part of me would think, why would you pretend... Or why would you have a racially ambiguous name? It's not as if you're going to get more gigs being that person. But we have to remember, back in 1990, there must have been a time, especially when, you know, I'm assuming those massive house DJ names, you know, some, you know, icons from the Chicago house era were really doing bits in the US, especially, right? Um, or internationally in terms of, you know, the exposure, in terms of how many records they were selling. Because I, I remember... Motor City Drum Ensemble, funny enough, another person that people are saying should change their names. I remember once him saying when he was doing a record digging thing that he always tries to buy records when he's trying to make samples, when he's trying to get samples. He just buys whatever record he can find in a record store that has like a black singer on the front. He doesn't care what it is. He says it's always going to be something golden that he can use. So if you think back to 1990 and you think if you're some, you know, British dude, or some regular dude that has a name, Dave Lee, and you're a producer, and you want to get your name out there, and you want to shift records in your shop, and you know how people, you know, it's pre-internet, people um, are going to come in and just, you know, grab the thing that looks the most exotic or the most, you know, um, sexy, and buy it, because, you know, if it's if you got Joe Negro sitting next to Junior Vasquez, you're definitely going to buy a new Joe Negro record, the Joe Negro record, sorry. So it's interesting, isn't it? But then, at the same token... I guess nowadays, like myself, when I was when I was first getting when I was first playing techno records, I'd say I had one of my names was Thomas und Thomas, right? Um, it means Thomas and Thomas in German. And part of the reason that I used that moniker and I had like a random picture of like um, Joaquin Phoenix as my avatar, was because I wanted to be, I wanted, I wanted my identity to be concealed so that I could give my myself a chance to play in more in Berlin clubs with having a German sounding name. That's what I did, right? a bit ignorant at the time you're a bit naive to think that just having the name alone was going to get me gigs but you know when i thought that was what you needed and i'd email burger directly my dj mixes i thought that would work of course it didn't work but i'd imagine it must happen to more prominent P, uh djs especially my minorities who feel as if they're not getting a, a look in a club because they've got like a you know a quintessential kind of let's say a black dj name a hip-hop name or a name that kind of uh, speaks to their racial identity. They feel as if they had to kind of, you know, play some play some games, right? Um, but interesting, isn't it? Really interesting now. Oh, but again, it, ma it makes him look worse, to be honest. 30 years and he f decides to change it now. Anyway, it says here, it continues. Uh, the, um, it says the Spanish house label Blanco y Negro. Again, Negro, he loves this word, isn't it? <laughs> had a big record with uh, Real Wind House. And there was another song called Piano Negro. I felt Joey Negro gave it a Latin American feel so it would fit in people's record boxes. Many of the, the disco records I bought in the late 70s and early 80s were producers under the pseudonyms. There didn't seem anything odd about not using my birth name. Back then, I never ever imagined a name as a long-term thing that I'd ever DJ under or be addressed to as face-to-face. -face. It was just for the label for that record. Fair enough. Um, and the new groove record did okay but I didn't plan to use the alter ego however a year later I finished the new AP and I was going to use the alias Raven Maze <laughs> this guy is like <laughs> it's a little bit of a donut no like he seems obsessed with like picking names that have nothing to do with who he's about like nothing it's not it's not it's not like um I don't know how do I, I don't know um what can I say who's a good name uh it's not as if you it's not as if you expect the drums, right, an indie band to rock up and just have t shirts of the drums printed on themselves, right? Names are not that literal. 
but his obsession with having an alias that is sort of i don't know just ambiguous is really odd isn't it considering how english and you know straight laced he looks right don't you think that's strange that someone that looks like that would be so obsessed with making sure they pick names that are like you know uh roy what's what, what was that one he picked there con flipping arroz what raven maze like come on geezer man just 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 rock with your name like, it's very very odd i don't know what that says about him or what that says about me reading into it but hey let's continue but, but, but he says i was going to pick the alias raven maze but i played it to a friend and he said it sounded like a follow-up to the new groove release and nothing like the early raven maze record and i should use the name joey negro so that friend is always to blame remember blaming that friend he continues says i saw his point and took the advice on board a few months later i remixed a track off that ep into a song called do what you feel and that became a big club hit that got into the bottom end of the pop charts the name suddenly became well known to clubbers and record labels i then began doing lots of remixes and then i put the uh, and then when I put Dave Lee on the mix name credits the record label will change it to Joe Negra and in fairness to them this is, was the name that the general public was familiar with he's, so he's blaming his friend he's blaming his record label there's a lot there's a lot of dancing on here isn't it? to be honest he's not really own, owning up to it mate you've been using the name Joe Negra for 30 years you can't say you didn't want to use it it's a far superior name than Dave Lee right in terms of an entertainer I understand that but come on geez continues it says um over the subsequent years i've collaborated with loads of black artists and of course oh he's doing that i've got black friends thing oh no dave don't do that sorry continue. over the subsequent years i've collaborated with loads of black artists and of course the name has come up with many times whilst working in the studio i've explained the history of how it came to be and no one has ever had anything on the no one has any no one has said anything on the lines that they'd find it offensive or should i should change it in fact quite the opposite like a lot of djs there are, there are photos on social media flyers and interviews and they're obviously not black and it would be wrong if i was pretending to be imagine if you rocked up like racial dollars or in full blackface trying to dj in a sweaty 250 capacity bar somewhere with the makeup running down his face like <laughs> this dj world is flipping bizarre these guys are so odd it's so odd i just don't understand why <laughs> why would you use that name for 30 years if you knew it was the issue <laughs> oh he's a psychopath man let's continue <laughs> He says, I'm obviously not black. Yeah, we know that, mate. And it would be wrong if I was pretending to be. I don't think I've sold more records because... Mm, that's a lie. He says, I don't think I've sold more records because people thought I was black, but fairly ex fully accept that it could be a conclusion. Mate, he's, he obviously said up here that he wanted to have a name that sounded as sexy as Junior Vasquez and Frankie Nankles and, the, the, and the David Morales. And then he says here that he doesn't think he sold more records. This guy is an absolute melt. I swear, I'm sorry. De De in truth, that's why it's not good to find out, you know, to dig digging deep with your artists that you like. Just kind of enjoy the music and keep it moving because when you discover that they've got such <laughs> weird ways of viewing things, it makes you less of a fan. But anyway, let's end it here. It says, in truth, I've not felt comfortable with the name Joey Negra for a while, especially as I got older. Yeah, okay. So much so that you've only changed it when Twitter attacked you, right? Techno Twitter attacks. So I stopped using it a few times, but established a new name as an artist isn't easy, and I've ended up going back to it. Mate, you've got a name, just like God. Oh, this guy's an absolute weapon. It says I understand now though that it's not uh, appropriate for me to carry on using the name. I've recently received emails, tweets, etc., saying that it was unacceptable, and people find out if uh, out of place in 2020. And I agree. From now on, I'm dropping Joey Negro as a pseudonym, and all future releases that were already in production will carry the name Dave i'm sorry i've caused any offense my whole life has been about music but particularly black music i love so funk disco jazz and in any way <laughs> it's impossible for me to articulate in words that i have tried to champion with the best intentions please be aware that the changes are not instant everywhere best left <laughs> oh, this guy man the dj world is a weird world and it? it's really bizarre i don't know what to say to that one i think he's talking out of his ass personally you had 30 years to change it you didn't want to change it because it was you know it was a far better name than your own names that you made up that kind that for that con your arez whatever arrows one he had before was absolutely trash that ruby made so i understand why he wanted to change it but come on don't try and convince us otherwise you you wanted a cool black name because you were djing in the period when cool black djs were the in vogue you know and then now you've been called out for it, it is what it is just take it on the chin and keep it moving isn't it but these djs man bloody hell insane <laughs>
<laughs> oh, absolutely wild, absolutely wild. But let's continue. Um, what else should we for here? Oh, have you seen this? Um, this is quite interesting. So there's nothing going on in the uk in terms of parties it feels like right obviously i mentioned it previously in other episodes that most experts are speculating that we'll only see li live events or places people gathering in large crowds will be the last thing that will happen in terms of a restarting program in various nations across the world right that's the last thing that's going to be um put forward um because we've seen so far with different cases and you know whatever information we've got out there from all the leading um scientists and health professionals is that coronavirus or covid19 tends to spread a lot quicker in enclosed areas with loads of people talking shouting and screaming so without a, a vaccine without a cure those events are kaput but there are some places where things are starting to open up little by little where they're starting to do some events right there's that club in zurich i keep mentioning that's doing some events there's some uh places in paris that are doing some and there's obviously these and again a place that i'm kind of obviously naturally always upset with in berlin they've also started to do some really undercover sort of events that they're trying to put on at the moment now to kind of give people um some respite or some escapism during these dark times now personally for me i'm not comfortable with it i think you know it just feels i think i remember seeing a tweet of somebody i think it might have been louisa she mentioned it on twitter recently she made a poll like oh um i've you know her emails were starting to flow in with some markets uh inquiring whether she wants to play and the kind of suggestion was oh i'm okay playing but how do the club goers feel right what's what's the kind of sentiment and from what the comments i saw um most people were echoing my force where they're like they're happy that DJs are getting able, you know, able to go out and earn some money because, you know, if you're a DJ, essentially, you only get play, you only get paid when you play places, and with the whole world shut down, you know, your your finances are going to be really going to be impacted, especially if you don't have any productions to your name or the other means of income. It's going to be, you know, you're 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 on hard times right now. So if any work you can get, go and get it. But for a punter, it's going to be hard to justify the extra not to justify going out just during these uncertain times it just doesn't feel right especially if you're politically or socially act uh, motive uh, activated right in terms of taking part um in protests and going out and stuff it, you'd be hard to justify it's already hard to justify going out and protesting on mass right to go out again to pro to go out and party and get on it just seems a bit bad taste in it but people are doing it and they're doing it in interesting ways um in berlin i found that they're doing them in these disused bunkers that are, that are all located all, all over berlin i think they were used during the first i'm going to say or second world war um they're located everywhere dotted around and people are doing them and then there's also some images i've got here of possession france i think the first one was pick, let's let's pick possession first of all so possession is this party series i guess in where in france somewhere the suburbs of paris sorry and they do these events where they kind of announce them lastminute.com, you get a notice maybe through Facebook or in your phone. I'm not sure how they particularly do them. And then they have, you know, a, an entire sound system set up somewhere in the middle of nowhere where you just go and rave. And they're doing them now at the moment. It's making me really miss going raving, man. This is a video of VT, um, sorry, VTSS. <laughs> raving so much man especially in that kind of atmosphere like an actual proper party house but again i don't know how willing i'd be to go and attend something like that just for the sake of getting my groove on you know what i mean let me get another one as well another image of people party having a good time it's just like oh you kind of feel like you need to let everything die down and go back to normal for it before i kind of do this thing but look how good this looks this is a video of a dj called anita i think she's one of the residents at possession <laughs> Look how fun that looks.
That looks super fun, doesn't it? Come on, guys. How fun does that look? So, um, yeah, I guess some people are partying. Some people are having fun. Obviously, I'm not. And I don't know, man. Like I said, I just don't. I just don't think it's a. It's the right time to do something like that at the moment. And let me see if I can get find. Let me find this German bunker, which I thought was an interesting uh, way of doing it. Where is that video? Oh, I don't actually have it at the moment. It doesn't appear like it. Yeah, not download it. Where are you? Where is it? No, but it doesn't matter anyway. People are partying in Paris. People are having fun outside in the suburbs in Paris, and we're not. Again, I guess if you're from what i've seen they are still illegal i think for those to do those kind of gatherings but you know i don't blame it man i really don't and i'm not you know i'm not someone that's gonna get on my soapbox and start complaining like oh you guys are making it worse for everybody i think you know we have we all have the same amounts of information we have access to the same points of information our governments are all putting out you know daily numbers um, they're giving us some advice you've got social media you can kind of dip into as well so if you decide you want to go and party right now then go and do it in it why not because as i mentioned in my other podcast i just don't think live events will come back anytime soon anyway so if you really want to get your rocks off you have to go and get it in an absolute illegal way there's no other way to really do it no way no other way let's move on one other thing to talk about here da, 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 da. oh this one's a good one, isn't it? Well, it's not a good one for the parties involved, but obviously I'm sure most of you are aware that Megan Thee Stallion and Tory Lanez have supposedly were involved in some kind of shooting. We don't really know the details of the issue, but it's um, news that broke, I'm assuming, a couple of weeks ago where initial reports were that, um, that first of all, we saw that initial video of um, Megan Thee Stallion and Kylie Jenner hanging out at the mansion being rich famous and just hanging you know fabulous and then it cuts to a different story where we hear of a shooting or we hear that megan stallion has some glass in her foot and you know it's all up in the air we don't really have an, an idea on what the actual situation is but then some more details kind of come out and it transpires that actually potentially that tory lanes was was booked um because he was a person responsible for shooting and the shooting then affected or, you know, grievously or wounded Megan Thee Stallion. She posted out a statement, said she's on a man and she'll be back to performing soon. And since then, we've really heard any, nothing really from the whole situation. And it's really made me wonder, I guess, in terms of what actually happened. Everyone's curious because no one's willing to put any information out there from what it seems like. From what the information we have available at the moment, it, it looks like you know megan the stallion is purposely not cooperating with the authorities because i think if this was an issue just that involved a random stranger a regular civilian this would have obviously been you know there would have been charges already filed against the person i'm assuming but i don't know sometimes those level of celebrities they get cause some special disposit they get some special treatment but maybe not so maybe she's just withholding information because she doesn't want to put a fellow artist in more trouble than they already are we don't know who knows but regardless it's an intriguing case to look at so this is an article from billboard that sort of like lays down exactly what happened um it says here an argument involving tory lanes and megan the stallion last week resulted in the first in the first rapper behind bars after police um arrested him during uh no arrested him for finding a gun in his car and the latter in the hospital after reports said that lanes allegedly shot her Earlier on Saturday night, July 11th, Megan documented hanging poolside with Lanes and Kai Jenner on the Instagram Live. Police arrested Lanes for a felony count of carrying a concealed weapon in a vehicle last Sunday when officers found the weapon in SUV after receiving a disturbance call outside Hollywood Hills. I'm just interested at how it that's the thing and it? it happens a lot in it well, even just in regular life you've been out sometimes and you had to because that's the thing that i've always been really bad at over the years and i think i was good at it at a certain point I, i'm really good at it when it goes when it comes to being on holiday when i'm on holiday I, i've got it down to a t but you know when you go out and you're having a couple of drinks and you get that initial buzz and you're like oh, i'm having a great time right and you start to try and chase that that buzz starts to fade and try to start chasing it that's usually when your night starts to go meow. and then if you're mature enough or if, you, if you've got the wearable and you've got the you know you, you're in tune with your senses you can sort of pull yourself back from the pits of despair and embarrassment and sort of say you know what i'm going to pull the, the i'm going to pull the escape hatch i'm going to pull the parachute out and i'm going to go home you can do it sometimes but it takes a lot of practice it takes a lot of experience to go and do it and it happens often you know 
as like I said, I'm really good at it when I go on holiday. When I go on holiday, I'm perfect at it. I know exactly um, what to do before I leave. I don't pre-drink as much. I don't drink as much when I'm out on the dance floor. I take it easy because I know I'm going to be out the whole day, right? I don't want to peak too early, for lack of a better term. But it's interesting to look at this sort of picture, especially because they document everything, right? I don't. I saw, I tend to just go out there and live my life. But imagine documenting your amazing link up with, you know, another um, high caliber social media icon in Kylie Jenner. You know, you have this great time. It goes viral. Everyone's like, oh my God, I wish I was, all the boys like, I wish I was Tori. All the girls like, I wish I was Megan or Kylie's friend, right? It's, just, it's a really blissful, p- cute moment. And for that to suddenly transpire into seeing a video of what appears to be a Megan Thee Stallion limply um, hopping out of a car with a bloody foot, it's like, God damn it, man. Like, that's that's the crazy, that's the only insane part of nightlife. I, I love nightlife, but the only insane part of nightlife is that it can go from zero to 100 in a second, in a couple of minutes. Anyone that's been familiar with watching Walsh the Hip Hop videos knows, right? It, what looks like a really quaint, you know, um, petrol station, right? Suddenly can turn into uh, a scene of a sort of a John Wick movie in, in a matter of seconds. It's really, really bizarre how that can happen. It can only happen in nightlife. Um, that's them hanging out there. We had to come, um, we had to come kill the streets for, for five minutes. Okay. <laughs> Look at that smile. So, how did that smile go from shooting a short neck? <laughs> I don't know, it's hard to speculate what would cause a man to pull out a gun on a woman. Obviously, that's not on at all, but God damn it, man. I wonder what the argument must have been about. I wonder. But then a part of me also thinks, you know, if 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 it's to believed what we hear on online about them getting into some sort of argument and she wanting to leave and then sorry, saying no, allegedly, and then that's when the shot goes off, you have to give Megan a lot of credit for not filing charges, really, if you think about it, because she was definitely the one that was um she's definitely in the right here right if you just want to leave the car and go home like just black and white because there's other things involved there there's probably drugs i'd imagine alcohol in the system you know it can kind of mess up your decision making process but if if it's just a blackout situation of if you know the get the female feels uncomfortable she wants to leave your presence and then you decide to shoot her there's no rule there's nothing you can say that's going to justify that sort of reaction nothing in it like shooting is even more severe than saying the c word right or calling a girl a bitch or something right that that immediately inv- invalidates your argument i'd imagine shooting someone's the same so regardless of what he comes out about this whether or not she you know took the piss out of his dead mom or i don't know whatever like god forbid whatever is the reason for it no one's ever gonna accept it really are they so you've got an interesting situation here because i think i've always kind of been under the assumption my belief is that people in hip-hop don't really get cancelled it's very rare that hip-hop artists can get cancelled and not have a career again right for in my experience i don't know maybe you guys see it differently but i don't really see it happening that often like an artist does something really bad in public and then they get cancelled they can't sell records anymore it's usually you, you cancel yourself because you're just not relevant people don't care about your music you don't put any effort in but it's very difficult to get cancelled for what you do especially towards women in the hip-hop scene i don't know why that is so part of me thinks he could maybe write it out but how would you write it out i don't sure um i don't know i really don't it's a weird one to figure out of course megan would be completely fine i'm sure there's she won't be fine emotionally pretty sure you know being that trusting and open with people that might be her days are numbered doing that maybe there might be a conversation about her not being so quick to link up with randoms i don't know maybe whether that's, that's accurate that could be something there and obviously, career-wise as well, you don't really want to be associated with shooting in it if you're Megan Thee Stallion. You're kind of, I don't know, you don't really want to do if you want to be like a global icon star somewhere, right? You want to be as clean and cookie-cutter as it can be. Of course, you're going to want to have your edge, but this isn't the, the kind of noise that you want associated with your name. So it's really unfortunate for all involved parties. Um, it's interesting that the, the video kind of pauses here with Kylie out of the shot. Is she involved too? Does she play a part? Who knows? I'm sure the news will probably, um, they'll probably reveal all sooner rather than later. I think um, her publisher, I think she already put out a statement, didn't she, right? Where she kind of got angry at what Drea said about the whole incident. So I'm sure we'll have some information as to what exactly transpired very, very soon. But bloody hell, man, what a 
weird situation, but it's not that weird though, is it really? It's 2020, isn't it? Did it really catch you out of guard when you heard it? Don't get me wrong, it was shocking, but it didn't floor me. I think any other any other year that happening, any other year, a really popping R&B singer rapper um, shoots uh, an extremely popular um, hip um, female rapper, it would be you know it'd be on a timeline for you know for days and days and days. This sort of like went away pretty quickly, especially because no one decided to talk. So um, let's see what happens, man. Let's see what happens. We don't know. We don't know. Next on the list. What else do we have here? Ba, 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 ba. Let's get on the screen. Here we go. Do, 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 do. Oh, this is the one, isn't it? So, yeah, so this is what... Um... So, remember I mentioned at the beginning of the show about the Joey Diaz thing. So, this is from an episode. I think it's from... Uh, what's her name? What episode was it from? i got the number here. I'm going to play it for you guys. This is from uh, the Church of What's Happening Right Now, episode number 799, right? I remember I caught this a while back with the uh, Eleanor Kerrigan. And essentially, Joe Diaz let it be known that he had received some phone calls from some, you know, people involved in the comedy scene in L.A. who were essentially giving him a heads up that reporters and journalists from various newspapers were calling around trying to get some info as to, you know, what occurs in the scene and any sort of, you know, um, transgressions involving minors or young women that they could then add to their story. So the idea, so I guess the assumption is that Chris Lea wasn't the only person that they were kind of coming after. Um, it was sort of an opportunity to tear down what some people might think as a very uh, patriarchal, uh, misogynistic sort of scene in the LA's crew. It did, doesn't, from the outside, it doesn't look like that way for me. It looks like just, you know, social climbers, entertainers trying to make their way in the industry. But maybe if you're somebody that hasn't necessarily got the rubber to green in that scene and there's been some things, you know, there's been some extenuating circumstances, then you probably would feel a bit vindicated by it. But, but this might explain why everyone sort of threw chris under the bus this is a clip from that show i'll play it now for you guys to hear it bear with me there you go funny that now uh, because of what i found that about people making calls to seattle and denver it's so crazy they're gonna to go after comedy scenes in general mm -hmm. and then comedy as a whole and where yeah. it's gone and where it's happened and i can tell you something you know let's go back to the july of 91 i get into comedy i'm just happy that people accepted me i'm doing right. one gig a month i get into a contest i win the contest i become the house mc of this place this is denver or seattle this is, this is boulder boulder I, I started in denver now i'm in boulder i dig this waitress she's got a boyfriend nothing happens i dig this other waitress and we start dating you know so the whole year and a half that she drops a bomb on me. She's going to see it in New York to be a PR chick. And I started dating her roommate. And that went on until February of 93. Okay. And then, you know, that was really... My whole comedy scene at that time was the broker, my house, and, and every once in a while I get to ask to do a gig on the set. Let's for now, but essentially you get the whole gist, right? So my opinion on this is... It's interesting, right? Like, if there's some, if there are some issues within the comedy scene in general, or maybe the LA side of it, and there are some uh, bad actors that need to be rooted out, then I think some of these takedown pieces can be quite beneficial, right? It can put some. Of course, I've seen with the Harvey Weinstein is a good example, right? He's probably the most popular example where you know for years and years people have had there have been rumors and innuendos about his behavior but then it took a couple of brave women and some journalists to really dig into a story for it to kind of reach you know to have have some legs and essentially uh result in him serving a lengthy prison sentence and having to pay people loads of compensation and stuff so those things can actually really help and if if anything it, it also sends a warning signal a warning shot to any other you know up and coming creep not to do the same thing so you know all in all so net benefit but i think sometimes when it comes to like cancelling people or you know for i don't know some rude interactions some off-colored jokes and stuff that's when i think you can get a bit touchy especially when you 
start penalizing or start approaching or start maybe trying to attack people like a Joey Diaz, right? Who essentially has been a pretty open book for most of his career, right? He's for like for whether you love him or hate him, every week on his show, he tells you one of the most darkest, craziest stories about his childhood and it puts into context exactly how he is as a person. It, you know, it, it all makes sense when you listen to his stories of his childhood, when you see him interviewing his friends, nothing is surprising. So to then suddenly come out and with a story about your negative interaction with him when you were a young comic coming up in the scene and in the, in the scene also that doesn't have any rules right there's no that's the odd thing i think about this whole thing in, in every industry it must be difficult because there are no rules to making it in the entertainment world right on the arts it's really you just kind of wing it right there is no plan there is no step-by-step -step thing like even stand up they'll say oh you need 10 years to be funny but it's not you know it's not it's not a hard and fast rule for everybody that's just like a general sort of idea uh behind it but there must be some things that will occur um you know away from the limelight um maybe done in secret between comics because they just want to further their career that they probably wouldn't do in any other sort of um industry they wouldn't do it in any other area of their life but it sort of happens under the purview of um the comedy industry because it's at night and you're traveling to weird different places i can understand why some things can be a bit messed up so to suddenly sort of judge that whole come up in the lens of what's going on now societally feels a bit unfair that's the only thing for me it feels a bit unfair to judge what goes on in a seedy industry like you know start stand up for instance right where it's full of absolute degenerates full of people you know who've got some dark dark stuff in their wall covers right skeletons everywhere right bodies all over the place to somehow expect them to be i don't know model citizens is a lot to ask for and i think it's a bit unfair to ask for as well because part of the reason why you go to a stand-up comedy club especially you know some dingy one where you know they have random um open mice because you kind of want to go and dance in the dark side a little bit right you kind of want to tap into that you kind of want to play amongst those people be one with your own people as well so i don't know that's the only problem so i think again that that's the issue for me with the article but then i guess on the side of the crystalia stuff that probably explains why we haven't heard much from certain people right but hasn't really spoken about it joe rogan hasn't said anything some people are definitely avoiding talking about the topic and it could be because there's a lot more weight to it there's a lot more evidence there's more journalists digging into it there's more victim statements that are going to come out and it's really going to paint people in a really worse light than they did pr prior because these first allegations about chris apart from the one about the girl who he tried to hit up again when she turned 18 that was a bit weird most of them are a bit you know they're a bit whatever in it they're not that big of a deal that he you know obviously he looks like a creep and he's a bit of a sex hound but for the most part it doesn't seem like he was purposely going around trying to hook up with underage girls apart from that one where he kind of hollered at her when she turned 18 so um let's see let's see what what transgresses but i guess if you're an early comedian now you probably need to be banning your p's and q's <laughs> really because they're coming for you mate they are coming for you what else we have here da, 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 da. what else we have to talk about here that might be it now because we've got hit an hour i do not want to take up more of your time but um yeah maybe let's leave it there that's an hour of the show that's an hour of the excellent Zinger show thanks so much for tuning in as per usual i'll leave the other bits and pieces for tomorrow i've got another episode coming up then as well so do not be afraid one more episode coming until the weekend ends um but yeah thanks so much for tuning in to excellent Zinger show episode number 344 it's been a pleasure to have you with me if you're listening via the podcast app make sure you leave me a five star review and share that show with your friends if you're listening or watching actually i would say via youtube make sure you smash that like button down below hit subscribe leave me a comment down below leave me your thoughts and feelings and i'll get back to you and of course if you want to follow me on social media make sure you do that too links you'll find them in the description instagram twitter all one word agostino zinger instagram twitter all one word agostino zinger find in the show notes description add me follow me at me talk to me and i'll see you guys very very soon take care be safe peace